This is Empty the Bench with Tom Albano. Yes, maybe there is something to do with the age, but you know what, guys? Raping somebody at 16 and 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 is still rape! Nick Morgison. I guess you could say you could give this a proper 12. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't even hear it. And Nick Federa. There is no accountability for when players are accused of sexual assault or gang rape or DUI or DWI or, or anything that they'll term misbehavior. Empty the bench starts now. Dun, 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 This isn't game over. Episode 151 is just getting underway. I'm Tom. Damn. My 90s childhood died last episode. That's Nick Morgison. Oh. That's Nick Federa. I'm Tom Albano. I am back from my... Uh, well, I was there last week. I just walked out of it very early after that Conor McGregor story. So I, I can't say a one-week hiatus, but... One you week wait. Out. You wait, there's another story at the end of this episode that's going to get your blood to boil. And in more ways than one, too. <laughs> you started it, Nick. Now it begins. Before make we sure... begin... Yeah, go ahead. Okay, before we begin, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to ring that bell so you get notified for Empty the Bench, MMA Outsiders, Game On, Living Life, Beyond the Bench, Fruity Cereal... Make sure you get ready, you know, make sure you subscribe so that way you're with us through all of football season. Yes, football season is back, ladies and gentlemen. The Rapid Rundown makes its epic return today. Oh, my God, football. That means, wait, so we have football picks all the way through January now, right? Yes, yep. we do. Damn, it's that time of the year again where everything becomes great. And we've got just as much to complain about, so stick around. Yeah, so yeah, make so... sure you subscribe to that link, youtube.com slash ETB network, and uh, you can subscribe and follow our shows as well. Okay. Yeah, so we got week one predictions that are going to be coming up towards the end of the episode. We were going to talk about Serena Williams bowing out, ending her career after the U.S. Open, the college football playoff expansion. We're going to talk about MLBPA. I mean, the MLBPA, yeah, talking with uh, minor league player unionization. Uh, some restructuring and deals with uh, NFL quarterbacks. San Diego State, unfortunately, is back in the headlines again. And then not as big as the 50 minutes on Matt Areza that we spent last week, but still kind of. If you missed relevant. that, go check out last week's episode. But we begin this week's show with another new devastated New York team. No, it's not the Nets. It's not the injured Yankees. It's not the Giants or Jets that are going into their week one matchups with, uh, let's say, less than high expectations. No, it is the New York Knicks, more specifically the Donovan Mitchell-less New York Knicks, as Donovan Mitchell will not end up in a Knicks uniform. The Utah Jazz have officially traded him to Cleveland. Yeah, well, first... So I have to ask, is that for the Knicks because they didn't land Donovan Mitchell or is that for Donovan Mitchell because he ended up in Cleveland? Well, this is an odd situation because obviously Donovan Mitchell wanted out. Obviously, because we saw, um, why am I forgetting his name all of a sudden, who they traded to uh, Rudy, Minnesota, yeah. Rudy Gobert, who got traded for an unforeseen amount of picks, which screwed up the whole Kevin Durant situation, which screwed up a bunch of other trades. But... When I look at this deal, and I'm sitting with two Knicks fans, so don't throw something at me, but this they got nobody except for Colin Sexton, who is the one person in this deal well, that makes sense. The, well, I, I could care less about the protected picks. Well, I was going to say, well, Colin Sexton, they also had to do a sign and trade. He technically was not under contract. Right, but that's all money. That's yeah, that saying, but I'm saying Colin Sexton couple of you know no names three first round picks that are unprotected and two pick swaps this deal is basically colin sexton and a bunch of picks that's how i look at this deal uh, the other names are kind of just throw-ins because again 
for the millionth time that I have to say this, they have to make the money even and work. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how many times you have to explain it that it just goes over people's heads? <laughs> this is not baseball where you can literally just say, hey, we'll just throw you a large contract. You deal with it. As long as the commissioner's office approves of the deal, we're good. No, in the NBA, it's all about the money, money, money. Yeah, money. If I didn't make my point, money. So we have seen reports for weeks about who the Knicks were going to offer, who they weren't going to offer, who they shouldn't offer, how many picks they were going to offer. And we've heard the latest, the last offer that the Knicks were going to have to give up. There's mixed reports on it. So we had heard mixed reports on if RJ Barrett was going to be available. We've seen one report say that he wasn't, but then decision makers would be willing to let him in. Obviously that decision maker has uh, initials JD written all over it. By the way, the media is probably some of the dumbest people I've ever seen in my life. Whoever put that report out, who put that report out? Do you know about decision uh, makers? Decision maker, let me check. Because when we talked about that list, and I said it a couple of weeks ago, I'll say it again now. Whoever put that media report out is the dumbest media platform I've ever seen in my life. Decision makers, it's the owner or the GM. It's nobody else. So, ladies and gentlemen, I sit here as a Nick fan. Disgusted. Uh, S and Y. S and Y. Okay, then I hate to say this because we're in New York, but S and Y, you are a dumb, 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 da dumb, dumb, dumb. So, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, as a Knicks fan, I sit here with egg on my face because I truly believed that Donovan Mitchell to the Knicks could have worked out, but this is the reality we live in, where we don't live in a fantasy land. Candy. It, uh, Farts don't become candy. There are not rainbows in the sky. And the Knicks can never have anything nice because apparently Jim Dolan sold his soul to the devil in order to be able to play a guitar solo on stage. I hate to say this, but unfortunately, you're kind of the fool for believing that you thought he, he was going to no, make a trade. I, I, believe me, I'm complete. No, no, no. Not only am I the fool, I'm the court jester. I'm the one with the jangly hat going, hello, sire. I am here to entertain you tonight. No, court jester. I'm the court jester. But the problem here, and I understand your points, Nick and Nick, but the problem here is, Nick Morgan, you said, this is a little less than value than what the Knicks were getting. Oh, that it's, the a Knicks lot, were offering it's a lot up. less than value. By because... the way, if I had to rank the two trades, I think I don't even think the Jazz were getting proper value out of the Knicks, to be quite honest. They could have gotten more. But when I look at the deals... I look at the Knicks as like a, a B, B minus, and I look at the deal that the Cavs made with the Jazz, maybe a C minus, maybe. But considering that that RJ, uh, according to you know uh, our good friend Johnny from Game On, Johnny Montalbano from Game On, spec, well, it was reported that RJ Barrett was in this this deal. Uh, thank you, thank you for the pluggity plug plug. So. Apparently, R.J. Barrett and the draft picks were in this deal, um, the in this Knicks offer at every iterative stage of the deal, which would lead you to believe that the Jazz were never going to trade him to the Knicks. Ah, I don't know whether that's the Jazz front office being morons or are we overvaluing R.J. Oh. Barrett? Well, so there were also mixed reports about the states of Grimes and uh, Toppin of whether they were or weren't up for up for sale. Now, if they weren't, because I've seen mo more of the reports that maybe Grimes wasn't, you know, I would criticize that, that you're willing to offer up R.J. Barrett, but not a Grimes. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. However, if that report that you were referring to, which Johnny had explained uh, yesterday on Game On, if that's true, then I agree with you guys. That tells me that they never wanted to offer Donovan Mitchell to the Knicks. I, I said this to the guys in pre-show meetings before we started taping. The Knicks have become that barometer team when it comes to trades. Almost like what we said about how everyone in baseball uses the Yankees to see how far they can get an offer or a trade. The Knicks have become that new team. Because when they asked for R.J. Barrett right off the bat, my answer would have been, see ya, we don't need you. 
That and I know Knicks fans are going to get mad. Well, what do you mean you don't want to trade for a star? No, I'd rather build the core that this Knicks team has not they, done in they, over ten to fifteen years. They tried that though, and they've fallen flat on their face every single time they've tried to build the core because we're dealing with incompetent people here. Well, here's where the problem lies, and here's where the problem lies. I think Johnny might have been hinting at this, and Nick Federer, you're right. Because even I said it, you know, trade the picks, you know, throw the picks in because the Knicks don't really use their picks right all too often. However, there is something that we are forgetting as we've been talking about all this. Because of Mr. JD himself, the Knicks still have this reputation of the, of no free agents are going to want to go there. They've tried with LeBron twice. They tried with KD in 19 and Kyrie. Nobody wants to go to the Knicks because of the reputation that it has gotten thanks to a Mr. Dolan. So it, the no, worst no, part I, I wouldn't I would say it's entirely due to Mr. Dolan. But the worst part of this whole thing is the Knicks <laughs> keep uh, uh, jumping in their own pile of shit because every time they do the same thing, they clear the salary cap every time they set up for free agents. They believe they're going to get somebody. And then it's like fool's gold. They think they're getting I, something and then they're not. And then, then that leads to the overpays like the uh, who was it they got from the Mavericks? Oh, uh, Brunson. Brunson, Shit. that Brunson gets that big contract. Like that was know, an overpay by every sense of the imagination. Right. But they had all that cap room because, again, they keep clear. And who's not to say, like, people are probably going to come after me, but who's not to say if they had done this deal where they tr uh, flipped RJ Barrett to Utah and gone Donovan Mitchell, that it wouldn't have been the same song and dance over and over well, again? I'll but clear this exactly up. I'll clear this up because Johnny's been saying it, and I'm going to say it too, and Knicks fans are not going to be happy with me, but even if you traded, <coughs> excuse me, if you traded for uh, Donovan Mitchell, you weren't, you were going to make the play-in tournament. That's play -in tournament was the ceiling. And to be yeah. honest, even if you made it into the first round, you're going to get smashed. You don't have a second guy to go with Mitchell. You need two stars in this league to make even a sniff at the playoffs. Which... Which, you know, leads me to say that, you know, and, and it sounds hypocritical because I've said that the Knicks don't use their draft picks, right? So just throw more picks into this deal for Mitchell. But now in a situation like this where it's ever more clear that the Knicks are kind of, like you said, the barometer, the laughing stock, the court gesture, the NBA, and they still have this reputation where free agents and big names don't want to go. Right now, you don't have a choice. You got to continue to build this court through the draft like you've been doing. But the problem is they stink they in the draft. draft. They can't draft correctly, so so it's a catch twenty two. It well, really yes, is a it is. kind of situation. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, because <laughs> it really does seem to me like the Knicks are consistently a generation or two behind everybody else in the NBA. I I, I don't think it. NBA teams hit on a specific strategy. And then you start to see the copycats, and then the copycats of the copycats. By the time the Knicks get around to it, it's a fourth, fifth generation copy. It's a Xerox of 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 a Xerox. I agree with you on some things, and I disagree with you on some things. What well, I agree with you on the fact that they do not know this ownership and this regime does not know how to draft. I would have been okay if the Knicks said to the Jazz, "We'll trade you eight or nine picks." And we'll take Donovan Mitchell. You want eight or nine unprotected picks? That's the deal we're putting on the table for Donovan Mitchell. Okay. And look at what Danny Age has been doing. And I don't know how he's getting away with it. All he's doing is piling up first round unprotected picks. He doesn't care if the team competes I mean, this year. Well, I, I, it's clear. Well, it's clear the Jazz have been blowing it up. It's clear that. Uh, blow it up. They demolished it. They demolished <laughs> it. But, but, you know, at least there's a. There's a strategy, and they're committing to it whole hog. I, I mean, the Knicks are. I, I've, I've seen people on Twitter that are less deluded than the Knicks. First of all, they have no plan right now. The plan that the, the this uh, fictional plan that you're talking about is compiling all these first round picks. Now, let me, let me try to break this down as nicely as I can. First, having all these first round picks doesn't mean they're all going to succeed. Okay, that exactly. means if you, if you get, well, what does it matter? 
So if you have 10 picks, you'll be lucky if you get three of them to be stars or it's presentable that, players. You'll be lucky if you get one. Well, I, I try to be a little more optimistic in, in 10 picks, but uh, I'm not because you know what? I'm not even, I'm not even entirely, uh, I'm not even entirely convinced that Obi Toppin and RJ Barrett. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not talking about the Knicks. I'm talking about the jazz situation where oh, oh, oh. they, if, if you can get two or three players out of those 10 picks to succeed, then that deal worked out for you. And, and that's, and that's just to succeed for them to be a legitimate big star. You're lucky if one of those 10 are. I'm just tired of this whole thing where stars are basically saying, well, you know what? In my mind, it's not working here. So I am demanding a trade out. James Harden ring a bell in this situation? How about KD? <laughs> well, KD, K I'm finally glad that the Brooklyn Nets ownership, and forget me being a fan for a second, from the standpoint of Joe Tasai, and uh, why am I forgetting the general manager's name at the moment? Uh, Mark. Sean Marks. They finally said, you know what? We're going to stick our feet in the sand and say, figure it out, or you could sit out. Oh, baby, that ain't sand they're sticking their feet into. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, like, they stuck their feet to the ground. I mean, like, they're not yeah, moving. We're, anchor we're anchoring ourselves to the ground with, with a bunch of hammer and nails. Is what, is what and, I, and, and you know what? I respect it, because every other star... Before KD, James Harden got his way twice, twice, and now I mean, who knows if he'll stay in Philly? Well, there's at least, and because, and think about what think think what you will about KD. I mean, we definitely had our share of takes about it on this very program, but there is a sense of security and at least a guarantee of some wins when you have a the guy, when you have a superstar. On your team. And KD is a superstar. The problem is the Knicks are in a no-win situation either. They signed RJ Barrett, which is what everybody wanted as a young guy. People are screaming about it. Because <laughs> now because <laughs> now wait, 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 wait. And because he signed, they he's now no longer a trade ship because when you sign someone to an extension, you can't trade them in their first year. Yeah, but uh, you know what? I'm I'm happy to have RJ though. I'm just explaining what's going on in the Knicks fans' head, which is delusions of Granger. Because they want the star. They want to keep R.J. Barrett. They want James Dolan to spend $500 million bringing in all these free agents. And Welcome it's not New York, Nick. No, no, I'm aware. But I'm saying that Knicks fans are not thinking with their heads. They're thinking with their wallets that, that, <laughs> are, not, that are not even their money. Oh, by the way, uh -huh, uh -huh, New York, Nick. I knew you were going to go there again. Sorry, Nick. Because because we are desperate for some competence. I, I I'm desperate to, to be able to see some basketball that matters in April and May. Thank you very goddamn much. I I mean, if this was, if I if I was in the desert and needed water, and and the water was essentially the Knicks clinching a playoff berth, I would have been dead ten years ago. If you're waiting for competence, you might as well become a Nets fan at this point. Yes, I yes, I understand it. It is a Herculean feat. I, I am I am essentially pushing a rock up up, up a muddy hill. I I am cursed to be doing that. It, it uh, it's just oh god. You know what the sad part is. You you know what the sad part is. If he would just go out and spend the money, he might actually make some fans back. But again, but Nick, again, the problem is. The the reputation of Knicks has already been ruined to the point where he could throw all the money, and it's like, and it's like seeing you know the, the players see this money, and then they see it's coming from you know a possessed a team that's possessed by the devil, and basically these free, big name free agents are just holding up a crucifix to it, saying, "No, back, back." back. <laughs> the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> What's ironic though is in your cross section sport in baseball, everyone wants to play in New York. Or in well in the NFL it's a whole different issue because football people sucks. Wanna, but, no, again, people want to play for the Yankees and the Mets. They, well, I was they, gonna say, but but well, understand that the Mets are under a new ownership. If they were the Wilpons, I'd say the same thing. But you know, the Yankees, Mets, Giants, just for all the problems that we have with them, you know, they are still you know the problems don't you know bring down the fact that it is a big market team. However, with the Knicks. 
and James Dolan, the reputation of that team for the past couple of decades, it's done that. It has overtaken the fact that it is a big market franchise. Here's the deal. I'm like, going to make... If this was, say, 1997, then you could say, yes, the Knicks have the opportunity to bring in anybody they want because, again, they're competing. They have a core. They're good. I'm going to make a declaration right now. Okay. Uh, the Knicks are no longer a major market team. Oh. The I Knicks mean, are no, I mean, the Knicks, wait, wait. Technically you're right. Wait. The Knicks are no longer a major market team because they don't act like a major market team. They don't spend the money, they don't okay. bring in the players, they don't market, they don't brand. All they care about is themselves. Nick, okay, so then I was going to go to let me go to the comparison I was going to make. That we think the Knicks should be this big, humongous, monstrous beast in the Eastern Conference, but they just—they're just a little engine. I could that could. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And that, then they just exactly. Yeah, I mean, and they just derail. But that goes back to my you're, point. You're that not supposed to be the underdog when you're playing at Madison Square Garden, for God's sake. That goes back to my point. They think that because they're the Knicks and that they're at the world's most famous arena at MSG and that New York City is right in their backyard and that they have Broadway and that they have all these things in New York. Everything's automatic. <laughs> Everything's automatic. It's not automatic. The last James important game that was played at MSG, uh, the last important basketball game that was played at MSG happened when I was in second fucking grade. That's a good point. The 1999 NBA Finals were the last important basketball game played at MSG. I dare you to convince me otherwise. No, I, I agree with you. And when your crosstown rival in Brooklyn has already embarrassed the shit out of you by bringing in KD, forget Kyrie, but unfortunately he's considered a star, so you have to add it in the well, equation. Let me, add, let me add to that, Nick, <laughs> before you make your point. Let me add to it. Brought in KD... KD ends up requesting a trade three years later, and instead of KD leaving, they convince, you know, that they're under the terms now to stay. So it's like they've embarrassed you multiple times already. And the worst part is most people don't know this. KD wanted to be where? A Nick. Where? He wanted to be in a Knicks uniform. I know. Sorry. He was showing it, didn't he? <laughs> I hate to say this, and I'm sorry to give fans, uh, Knicks fans PTSD, but... He was trying to convince Kyrie to go to the Knicks, not the Nets. But then again, I mean, let's not act like the let's not act like the Nets are some kind of brain geniuses because basically Sean Marks and Joe Sy were basically using a landmine as a toilet seat for how many months? But wait a before second. They decided to, before they decided to, they were to work out to iron out their differences with KD. Nick. Nick, they were three inches. But uh, by the three point line away from heading off to where? And you, but again, you spent this entire offseason pissing away that goodwill and you almost stepped on your own dick and fell down three flights of stairs. <clears throat> yeah, but KD and the Kyrie did it to themselves. The fact that it got that close, the fact that KD changed his mind when he had the finger on the. Tw his finger on the trigger of getting traded and sending this team back to the Jersey doldrums they belong in. <laughs> Don't get mad at me for this, but KD was too busy fingering his own ego that more than figuring out what his situation was. Okay? I know I know that's going to cause a graphic for most people, but my point is that KD was more worried about his ego, not this team. The Sean Marks and Joe Tessai need to figure out how this team runs. So, in the meantime, guys, has anybody seen Kyrie? Oh, wait, I see him now, and he's still getting chased. He's still getting chased by that giant anthropomorphic needle. I still have no R -E -L -A -X. idea. R E L A X. Oh, you shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, In, that, that's perfect. Immunized. He's, he, Kyrie is going to say, wait, wait, wait. I am immunized. I've hey, been, man. I've been immunized using hummingbird eyelashes and rhino horns. Hey, they don't have to wear masks this year uh, for the NBA, according to the new rules. So, so, you know what, Kyrie? You've got nothing to bitch about. You won, dickhead. Congratulations, dickhead. You won. Damn it. I wasn't ready. Congratulations, dickweeds. I don't know. Uh, Long story short, I would say that the Knicks got fleeced in a funny way. They really did. So Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. 
Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. All right. Time to give a proper goodbye to Serena Williams. So Serena Williams putting up a, a hell of an effort, pulling up an upset in the second round of the U.S. Open, but with guts in the third round, but ended up falling. Uh, her and Venus lost their first round women's doubles matchup. As a result, Serena Williams, as, as promised, her career appears to be now over. After was 2022 now, so 10, 20. We're talking nearly, do I say, we're talking 27 years. 27 years of basically, and she has, and I, I said this in the minutes I did over the weekend, um, that, I mean, as much as we would have liked, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm sure all of us would have liked to have seen her pull Michael Strahan and, and, and go out on top. But, uh, I mean, to be honest, to be honest here, I mean, everything she was doing from this point on was gravy because she but, did everything she needed to do. Even though I think the U.S. Open was basically waiting on her hand and foot for every match. Oh, she made the she made the uh, that was like Derek Jeter's retirement tour in twenty. It was worse. It was worse than Derek Jeter's retirement tour because at least you saw Derek for one hundred and sixty two games. They could, but they come out of you knew <coughs> they were going to come out of find the shit out of this. No, no, but I'm saying is they put her in prime time every single match, and she was going to be in prime time until she was out. Because uh -huh. th think about what tennis kind of was in the early to mid nineties. It wasn't before, before the before the um, before the Williams sisters got uh, you know got the I mean before Martina Nav uh, Na was it before or after Martina Navratilova? Uh, Navratil I think it was after her. It was after her. After her. After Billie Jean King. I mean, who changed the sport on her own accord? Who changed the sport on her own accord? For but again, that was a generation prior. We're talking about the two of them, and you can't talk about Serena without also talking about Venus. Well, I'll give you another name. You have to throw Steffi Graf in there also. There's they, quite a there's quite a they, few names. They became they put the sport on its head. They changed it and they were rock stars doing it. Well, there's other factors. You're talking about black young girls yeah. coming up and and not just for tennis, they changed the whole sports dynamic as a whole. Now, if you saw the movie King Richard, by the way, which was a really good movie, they really play out how, even though their f their father was a little cuckoo out there, he really pushed them hard, and they became stars They're, afterwards. Well, goes to what I've said the couple of times we talked about Serena and her pending retirement on the show, is that transcendence, they have trans... Serena and Venus have transcended sports. Not not just their sport, but sports. That they basically were big figures outside of tennis. That they became ingrained in pop culture because of their accomplishments on and off of the court. They, exactly. they gave black female athletes the voice that they did not have over the last couple of decades. And now you see people like Coco Goff, who unfortunately, as of this taping, was eliminated and <clears throat> no longer in the U.S. Open. So I think there's only one American left on either side for the men or or women. I think it's uh, uh, Francis Tiafo, who's another great story on the just, U.S. Just, who did he just eliminate? Rafa. Rafa. <laughs> and, and he looked great doing it. So, uh, But I don't even know if... But that's why it's so because uh, again the sports media is so um, eager to you know crown the next well, Serena Williams. And it, I don't know. I don't know if there is anybody like that out there right now. I mean, Naomi Osaka is great, but she's got you know a long to a long I, way to go before she. Well, you know, I did a minute on it. So I Nick Morgan yeah. thinks it's Coco Golf. I think it is going to be Coco Golf. Coco Golf, by the way. Who eighteen years old and playing as well as she's done so far? Most people don't remember she came up as a Wimbledon qualifier at the age of fifteen and beat who? Do you know who she beat, Nick? No, I don't. Venus Williams. She beat Venus Williams as a Wimbledon qualifier at fifteen years old. Okay, Coco Goff is going to be the next 
big name when it comes to black females oh, in the gonna, tennis space. I was going to say, the opening is right there. They have the same type of games. And 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 it's not even that it's not even that she's one of the greatest black athletes of all time. She's one of the greatest athletes. Period. I hate you to, that we have, you don't even have to use that qualifier. Well, I was going to say it, I, it means it means a lot that you do mean use that qualifier, but you don't have to. I I was going to say I hate that we have to use that qualifier. We should be able to say someone is great regardless of what they look like. But representation well, does matter. Well, I think the thing now is what you were referring to, Nick Borgerson, is you tennis needs somebody like a Coco or an Naomi. They they now that Serena is has left the game seemingly, and Venus may not be too far behind. Like she's she's pretty much done. Yeah. That's major blows to tennis. The, like and, well, and tennis is one of those sports that I think I even mentioned it. We were talking about soon again that it, it needs more star power. We're missing the American presence when it comes to the game of tennis because when you look at who's left, Serena and Venus are gone. A lot of the other Americans are going, you don't see an Andy Roddick from over a decade ago still playing. You don't see Agassi playing. You don't see Sampras. You don't see these guys that were really the Better. game of, of tennis. Well, I'm talking about American. Oh, but yeah. Because there's more than enough foreign players that are taking up 95% of the draw. Nadal, who had his 22-match winning streak uh, uh, broken, the first time he lost to an American since like 2007. At a major. So in other words, basically, tennis is fine everywhere else. But like we're look, here in America, we need now to look for our next big star. U.S. tennis is in trouble. That's the best way I can put it. <clears throat> I mean, I think that Coco Golf can be that next person. But she's 18 years old. She needs to develop her game and play. She's doing well. Hey, she made it to the quarters of the U.S. Open. That's hard. At 18 years old, that's hard. But, or you could be in your 30s. That's hard. Mm-hmm. So with Serena retiring, there's a gap, but her career was basically over. She hasn't won since like 2017 it was the last time she won a major. She would, she had her first kid. She wants to have another one. Her career, she was already heading off to the other side of her career. So she was pretty much done. But still, so. I mean, she doesn't even, Coco Golf really doesn't need to be uh, you know the, the next come the next coming of Venus or Serena, she could just be herself, and you know that that's enough. Well, actually, I'll give you one more, and it kind of fell be, beyond the wayside. Sloane Stevens was supposed to be the next Serena Williams. Everyone remembers Sloane came up, burst upon the scene. They th and her game was exactly like Serena's, and then she kind of fell off the map. I think she was a a French Open finalist. I think last uh, last uh, this coming well, last year, I should say. And she didn't end up winning, but or did she win? I don't know. I can't remember. My point is that everyone thought it was going to be Sloan, and Sloan fell off the face of the map. So who knows? I don't. I don't like it either. Where you say like people have to be the next whatever in any sport, it is. It's kind of ridiculous. You need to be your own self and build your own brand in the game, and not Very rely true. on other big brands. Look yeah. at Tiger Woods in golf. Everyone keeps saying, well. I guess he'll be the next Tiger Woods or the next Jack Nicholas. Yeah, Talk about an old phrase. Yeah, but don't be the first them. Uh, don't be the second them. Be the, be the first, first you. you. I'll give you another one. It used to be, oh, I want to be the next Michael Jordan. No, now it's I want to be the next LeBron James, which I don't know if I agree with that. But my point is that it's all about who's the all-time person. No, be you, not them. All right. So this is going to turn into an episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood really quickly. <laughs> College football playoffs. So <laughs> every year we talk about expansion. Every year, we, you know, it's always, oh, this team was out. They should be in. But why did this team get in as a three or as a four? What are the college uh, football ranking committees smoking? Well, after all the discussion, there was a discussion for years that maybe it would expand to eight. No, we're going to go one step further. We're going to 12. Wait, did someone say 12? <laughs> oh, God. Wait, we expanded to 12. What's next? Can we just call it the college football March Madness? I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was next. 
It's, what? You know what? Yeah. You know what? I'll go one step further. Why don't we just put every freaking college football team in the playoffs and let's make a large bracket. We'll put it across like 10 walls and we'll just make a bunch of matchups that we like because that's what these contracts are for because they want to spend $7 billion on college football and just make it whatever you want. Let's just have a bare knuckle brawl instead of playing football. Yeah, let's just... And honestly, let's just throw four SEC teams in there because that's all they want. They just want SEC teams. Anyways, those of you who missed it, let me explain this new college football playoff format, which is actually going to begin in 2026, so it's not going to take effect right away. There's still they four tried. More years before. They tried. They tried for 2024, but they but miserably failed. Still a couple, yeah, so there's still going to be a couple more years of the four-team format. So in the new 12-team format, it will be six. It will be 12 teams. Six, the six highest ranked conference champions. And then the other six teams will be made up of six of the best at large teams. The four best conference champions will be seeded one through four, and then they will receive a first round bye. And then the conference champ, you know, the fifth best conference champion plays the lowest wild card. The sixth, the last ranked conference champion plays the second lowest wild card. And then the four other wildcard teams will play one another. The uh, the first round with those five to 12 teams, that will take place in the second or third weekend of December. The quarterfinals and semifinals will be played in bowl games on a rotating basis, kind of like the college football playoff of now, with the championship game at a neutral site. By the way, did they consult Rob Manfred on this? Because it sounds very similar to the MLB playoff where they have like the wild cards and then the first, the highest ranked teams have the buys. He must have consulted Rob Manfred on this one. Wait, I, I have a list of consultants here on my computer, gentlemen. I, and I have an interesting name that I, I don't recognize on this uh, advisors committee. This is a Mob Ranford. Oh. <laughs> Is he wearing comically oversized uh, sunglasses, a Groucho nose, a little mustache, and a, and, a, and, a, and a baseball cap? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that that's him. Yeah, sometimes he sometimes he goes into the public bathrooms and, and steals all the toilet paper for, for some strange reason, but no one knows why. <laughs> so, so are we also going to introduce the Ranford man? <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, ladies and gentlemen, it's just if this was was mystifying you, stupefying you in any way, that these that these decisions would be made. You must understand that 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 sound effect just there is about the Benjamins, the dead presidents, the shekels, the green, the cattle, the money. All right, it, it's all about. It is all about the green. I mean. Maybe I'll like it if this means somehow a non-SEC school other than Clemson gets to win a national championship for once. But I, I mm. if that could lead to if that could lead to Michigan finally winning a national title, I mean I'm not going <laughs> to complain. I, I, like, I, I like Michigan, but no, no. I, I wait understand. a minute. Wait, my, my family are big Michigan fans. So wait, wait, so you want Jim Harbaugh to actually win something? I mean, I always liked him better than Jim, but maybe that's just because he was comically he was he was comical when he was mad. Well, I mean, let's let's just face it; it's just going to be more championships in the cabinet of Nick Saban. Yeah, you're basically first of all, you're basically gift wrapping these championships anyway for Alabama and and Ohio and not even Ohio State, uh, oh, Alabama and Georgia and Clemson and LSU. It's money. I've already said this a million times. Okay, seven billion dollar college football deal. Seven billion. As if the cream puff schedule was not already a dead giveaway. Uh, I, again, seven billion dollars. The fact that this is a seven billion dollar investment in industry for these people is not nothing. It is the raison d'etre. The the, the reason why they do everything they do. You I'll, want to know why it is the way it is? Follow the money. Well, yeah, I'll give you one more issue with this. Think about this. You know how some of the big teams, like they basically pay for these bullshit matchups with like division three schools so that they can get wins. Now that you're adding more, 
guess what happens? Oops. More crap matchups so that the, the big teams can get more victories. Western Colorado State matchups. Here we come. Hey, Arizona State. So much for your partying. We'll take a victory. So we need, to get, gonna... we need to get bullshit bowl games, too. Well, I was going to say, are we going to get an Arizona State versus DeVry University game? <laughs> the Preparation H. Hemroid Bowl. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I was going to say, so so it was what? It used to be, this long, for this time, it's been six wins gets you a bowl game. Something six like that, six. yeah. So, so it was a five and seven record now going to get you into a bowl game at this rate. I mean, wouldn't you like to play in the Fiesta Bowl? <laughs> No, would you like but, wait? Wouldn't you like to play in the Manscaped Bowl? How about the Toyo Tires Bowl? The Toyo <laughs> Tires Bowl, the Michelin Man Bowl. You know what though? I think they just have all these bowls so they can get these sponsors in. Oh, the oh. The, the, the Balance of Nature Diarrhea Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The one eight hundred C A L L A T T Bowl. <laughs> the Cars for Kids Bowl. <laughs> It goes on for seven hours, and they keep they keep singing that song over and over. Oh God! <laughs> See, when Barstool tried to sponsor one of the bowls, and they got in trouble for whatever they didn't get in trouble. Actually, they for some reason didn't want their money, but they're willing to take money from uh, stool softener companies. The WWE Two K Twenty Three Bowl. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> and Vince McMahon is just going to show up and say, "Damn it!" for the whole time. The Kohler Toilet Bowl. Golden toilet bowl. <laughs> now that's good. We should get a copyright on that. Got to come up with the fake, the fake names for for bowl games. All the uh, oh, the Poland Spring Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> the Poland Spring Water Bowl. God, that sounds like that sounds like a bunch of dogs, not a bunch of football players. <laughs> even uh, though I think, even though I think Nick Saban and Alabama are a bunch of dogs, no pun intended. <sighs> They got that dog in them. Wow. <laughs> the adult diaper urine bowl. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Yuck. Ew. Okay, stop me before I can. <laughs> okay. MLBPA. Well, for the longest time, minor league players have not been unionized. For the longest time, we've heard about the minor league players getting low pay i think some players in the lower a, uh, a classes still get only 400 500 a week in terms of pay although we have come some ways and that mlb is actually paying for the housing for these minor league athletes however we still have the likes of rob manfred basically trying to see no evil hear no evil speak no evil when he says hey you know we're going to you know, like we pay our minor leaguers a living wage. It's a living wage. They oh, can brother, they can make a good living. This guy stinks. <laughs> which is really the only, which is really the only valid response when you're talking to <laughs> something that Rob Manfred is. By the way, can you? About. I think we need a certain banner for this situation too. If you if you catch oh. my drift. Yes. Be yeah, because again, congratulations, Rob Manfred. You screwed it up again. Your track record is so good that it's terrible. I mean, he'll talk all about treating our minor league as fairly and doing all these things. He'll talk a big game. But yeah. the word union is used and he shits his britches. Wait a minute. Well, He's wait looking. a minute. Wait a minute. He said that he treats his players with a living wage. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? Oh my God! Stop fucking lying. Yeah. So, my point. as I was saying, remember he also used to work, I think, for a firm that was uh, anti-union busting, trying to break. <laughs> yeah, union busting. Uh, anyways, minor league. So I was saying about minor league salary. So rookie ball players only are guaranteed four hundred dollars a week. Single A, $500 a week. Double A, $600 a week. Triple A, $700 a week. Pay does not start becoming significant until a player, a minor league player goes on a team's 40-man roster because then technically they're represented by the MLBPA, which means their salary increases to the Whatever minimum the, 500, yeah. 500000 I'm just doing quick math in my head. So which one was the 400 a month? Uh, rookie ball. So, that's so each six... level of so each level of minor league ball 
you go up by a hundred dollars. But then once you go from seven, you go to the majors. I mean, forty man, you go from a seven hundred dollar to five hundred thousand. Yeah, how the hell does that scale work? So sixteen hundred dollars a month times twelve. That's for rookie ball. Sixteen hundred times twelve. Yeah. Nineteen thousand two hundred. Yeah, that's not living wage. I don't care where the fuck you are. Because, again, I, I don't think that the MLB actually realizes that things cost money in this country. I mean, it's it's not like Rob Manfred where you're absurdly wealthy and you can buy seven different mansions and there are only two coasts in the there are only two coasts in the United States. Well, guess what? He's in the commissioner's club. You know how we have the owner's club? We have the commissioner's club now. Look, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we know that union representation is the best thing for the minor, minor league players. In order, I mean, we can talk about, you know, gra improving the living conditions, and that's definitely necessary, but it's a half measure. Because if you really want, I, I mean, think about what we've been, what the major leaguers have been able to get because of the union, free agency. Contract protections. We've been able. You've been able to get paternity leave. You're able to get guaranteed contract. What make? And imagine what you'd be able to get if minor leaguers were able to form a union. The one issue that no one's talking about, and I think this is part of the reason why they're trying to unionize between the MLBPA and the MILB, uh, is that the um, what's the issue they talk about? Keeping players down in the minor leagues, keeping their player clocks, manipulating, from yeah, manipulating oh. service time. That that is the biggest issue of all the issues right now. Look at some of the players we've talked about this over the years, where guys could have gotten their money sooner, but they're manipulating the service time. And it's a lot oh, of crap. The, what it is, by the way, more than fifty percent of minor leaguers have signed authorization cards in support of union unionization under the guidance of the MLBPA. They only needed means, they only needed thirty percent. Correct. So now it's going to go to a vote. Unless MLB chooses to recognize the union on its own. I'll tell you right now, and Nick, you're not going to like what I have to say. MLB is not going to like the unionization. Yeah, they're, they're going to. They won't. No, I, I agree with you because they're going to do this kicking and screaming. Because well, yeah. what's going to happen is what's going to happen is. And I, I, I'm sorry, MLB fans, if you're listening to this, there's going to be another lockout. I mean, I hope we can avoid it. But you know what? I mean, MLB is always dragged into the best decisions, kicking and screaming. The only thing, the only downside to, oh, I don't know how much you want to call it a downside. I think I read somewhere on the score is that that whole little uh, possible litigation against MLB questioning the, it's it would go trust, away. It, it, it would have it would to go, go away if ML, if the minor leaguers unionized. Right. Because now you're fighting with them directly as opposed to dealing with them separately. So ML MILB needs to think about what they're doing. Also, it's a two it's a two pronged sword. It it is it, it's a double it's a it's a, it's a double edged sword because it's like you need you need to be able to represent yourself, but you need to be able to you know elect people that can actually fight for what you want, and not just roll over and show the belly every time the league kind of bears its teeth. If that's the case, then Tony Clark needs to go. I, I, and I'm not just Tony Clark. Everyone who's at the top representing the MLBPA needs to go. Because they're going to cause another lockout. All right. Uh, Tony La Russa, He is now taking an indefinite leave from the White Sox due to... Gee, uh, I wonder medical. why. Well, I, firstly, you have to make, hope that nothing is wrong with the man. You know... As bad of a manager as we think he was with the White Sox, as questionable as his moves are, you know, you want to hope he's all right. You don't want to wish ill. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, you don't you don't wish any any harm to the man because you know discount what he's done with the White Sox. I I I mean, the man is will still go in the history books as one of them as one of the greatest you know MLB managers of all time. Just based based on the strength of what he was able to build as a member of the uh, as the manager of the Cardinals. However, okay, but that part of his career lasted for how long? Well, well again, however, however, maybe it is for the best that that in this indefinite leave is permanent, and the White Sox move on yeah. to a manager who is better with younger players. Because you could you could see from day one that this was not going no. to be a good fit. 
you you could you could tell from day one when the Hall of Fame basically shamed him for coming out of retirement. Well, because baseball is the one sport where you and don't you come don't, out of retirement. You don't do that. I mean, I've seen it done in the NBA, rare, more for coaching than for players in the NBA. But I've seen it in mixed martial arts. It's a little different, also because it's okay, an individual right. sport. But right. my point is, you don't see it in baseball. First of all, when you're in the Hall of Fame, usually you're old to the point where your body is broken down. You can't go back and play baseball. AARP. Yes. I mean, again, it's different because he was a manager and, but this was a matchup made in hell when Larusa was brought in to be the manager of a young team. I mean, heck when he got into that fight with, uh, what was the young, uh, star shortstop who, uh, did the bat toss. Tim, a uh, oh, Tim Anderson, Tim Anderson, Tim Anderson, yeah. who did the bat toss. And then Tony Larusa basically cursed them out and, pulled out the old fashioned manager on him. No, 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 you can't do that. Actually, was it Tim Anderson? Yeah, it was Tim Anderson. Yeah, but I, uh, I, I mean, at it, at it, yeah, it, it's pretty obvious that it's, it, I mean, Jerry Reinsdorf. Uh, yeah, Tim was, Anderson, it was. Oh, it was. Okay. So, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious that Jerry Reinsdorf, the guy, who owns the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Bulls, by the way, uh, thought that these young whippersnappers need some discipline. And it's pretty obvious that it was not that. Well, I mean, how many years did you set this team back? Well, hiring we, a guy who shouldn't have gotten the job. Well, we've kind of seen the positives and negatives on both ends. Like we've <laughs> seen, we've seen a Tony La Russa where things go don't mash and go wrong. We've seen it with Joe Girardi with the Phillies. But we also have seen the positives of an older manager who's wiser and knows how to handle himself. Yeah, you guys might hate when I, you know, you guys might yeah. hate when I say it, but I'll, uh, a Buck Showalter who's with a the Buck, Mets. Right? Yeah, Buck Showalter with the Mets. I mean, Joe Joe Girardi with the Yankees in two thousand and nine. And but again, we're talking about. But a, even then, um, but I was gonna say, Nick. Even then, I think two thousand nine different era of baseball. Then I agree. Yeah, it was. No, but you're right. you're right. It was the one thing I would say though is Buck Showalter was the best thing that could have ever happened to the Mets. I, 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 yeah, it's, I, it's I, pretty obvious that he had what they needed. All right, I was gonna say I hate to say, I don't know if it's not necessarily true if he would have meshed well with this current Yankees club, but I did advocate for him after Girardi's firing. I but agree. You did. I, you, did. I, you did. I you did. I remember that. Uh, but I, um, and most people don't remember in the nineties, he got fucked by the Yankees in the nineties. He was responsible. He he was partially responsible for that nineties dynasty. Right. So not uh, taking anything away yeah, from yeah. Corey, but I'm saying he helped, him, helped him and it. Stick him and Stick built that team basically. By the way, helped like, cultivate it. Yeah. Buck Buck basically handed it off to Tori and said, "All right, you go win. Run, run with it." Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I I'm not a big fan of. Tony La Russa, especially, <coughs> excuse me, after the incident with the DUI. Do you, well, know who I am? Do you know who I am? I'm Tony La Russa. I'm there, in the Hall of Fame. There is something to be said about being a player's manager in, in, and because, you know, the era of a hard ass is kind of gone. It well, is gone. Well, uh, what's his face? Uh, kind of took a lesson from him. What? Uh, with that, do you know who I am? Oh, I am uh, Ozuna from the Braves. Oh, yeah, Marcel Ozuna. <laughs> <laughs> Took right I, after Tony LaRusso. <laughs> by the way, ironically, since you brought up the Braves, Bobby Cox, he kind of got phased out of the game because mm -hmm. all he did was go out and yell at umpires and get ejected every game. But uh, again, because the era of that manager, Bobby Cox, Tony LaRusso, Lou Pinella, the hard ass whip cracking manager, he is not, again, you need. I hate to say it because you know you get the ire of 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 you Yankee fans just well, mentioning gonna, his name, but well, you're Aaron Boone kind of kind of mm, kind of manager. But I think I think you need someone who is willing to put the foot down when it is time, and I, that's my one. Like you're right, and in, in Boone in that, but I think sometimes Boone lacks that. You need someone he who's does, he to, does he does lack that. And a lot of the the I mean we're not gonna we're not gonna go into it this week, but but. You know, the we'll get into the Yankees, Yankees struggles you, later. This yeah, later you could, but you could, you know, chop that up to chalk that up to a combination of Boone's own shortcomings being magnified by the boneheaded personnel decisions. That uh, well, I think I'll it's also. You, oh, I was gonna say I was gonna have one more thing. I think 
I think somebody like a boon you can do like you can do as long as you have a player, namely a veteran player in there to be a locker room leader, a la your Derek Jeter or your, your Derek Jeters, your Aaron judges, your Francisco. Your Mike Trouts. Well, I, I would question that last one. I don't know if I consider Lindor a leader. Yeah. But I was going to say, and nickel and you, Tom, for sure. will hopefully get this reference. There's no more Bobby Knight. In, in the aggressiveness no, of no, managing a team. Yeah, no, no. No. <laughs> My point is that Bobby Knight was whipping chairs on people when they were not doing what they were supposed to now. But, but, like, I, but like I said, the era of the hard ass has passed. And I think that's bad because the players of today get away with murder. You know what? If it produces the results that, that, that MLB fans and the MLB itself wants – which is championship? Well, I don't care who the Nick, fuck they are. Nick Morgison. But I think also part of that also has to deal with general managers wanting more control of their teams in Major League Baseball. And that's such, want, that's, such a load of shit. that's such a load of shit. And everybody knows it. Because to say that the ownership or the general manager, if they want to control the team, then let them come in the dugout and manage it themselves. Because that's what they're doing. They're basically being a, a shock puppet. I mean, it's perfect but since we're hey, talking about you, NFL. But no, don't, don't shoot the messenger there, man. He's just saying. No, no, no. I'm not. Is that's what it is? No, no, no. I'm not blaming him. I'm just saying it's a load of shit because so, he, what he what he's saying is right because technically the GMs want to control the situation. The only reason Aaron Boone is the manager of this team is because Brian Cashman has control over him. Actually, Nick, now that you say that, John Gruden would make a hell of a coach in Major League Baseball. <laughs> Yikes. I mean, he's got a little <laughs> bit of a problem with intra-office emails, but you know what? <laughs> these are these are things I think PR can actually but, iron out. If but you know, <laughs> but but sock puppets. That's I right, mean, Mr. Gordon. I could be the manager. It's just a, you know, it's just a problem when he kept showing up to the employee luncheons with the sock puppets and one of them had a white hood on. <laughs> 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 Oh God! Uh, it's a right. good thing. It's a good thing. It's football season again. Yeah, let's go to let's go to football. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't like how we're starting football. Oh so, God! San Diego State has come out and said, basically, here's what they say: that the San Diego Police Department told them, "Do not do any of your own investigating until our criminal investigation is over." To me. That does not answer the fact that why it took nine to ten months for this whole case to come out. You suck. It, no, in fact, I'll go you one further. I think it's a hot bubble and crack of shit. Of course, <laughs> it's a lie. It is. It's a complete. It's a complete load of. Wait, 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 wait. Did you say it's a lie? Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? Ooh, oh my god! Stop fucking lying. Damn, that, that they, that's like a record. They just don't. They just don't want to be. They just don't. They they realize they lied. They realize they screwed up, but they don't want to be noticed backing out of the room. Slowly, Actually, so as uh, to avoid any kind of. Uh, I'll go one step further, and I'll say they know they were lying. They knew they were hiding this. They knew that they were doing this all for the money. They are now the the hand got caught in the cookie jar. It, it, it's probably it, you know it's like you know it, it's like those police thrillers when uh, you know the the office the, the officer is is assigned to look is is assigned to look for the mole, but it turns out he is the mole. So you're basically Perf. looking for wrongdoing when you really should be looking in a mirror. <laughs> so much for the punt god uh, lasting forever. It really did. Yeah, it really does. The 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 person responsible is really the guy who lives in your mirror the and looks god. exactly like you. The punk god was actually a devil in disguise. Oh, God. The devil went to Georgia. Oh, God. <laughs> no, in this case, the devil went to San Diego State. Same thing. <laughs> oh, uh, God. We got we got quarterback news. Quarterback, we do? We got quarterback contract news. So, Russell Wilson has to play the snap for the Broncos, and he's already gotten a five-year, $245 million extension, $165 million of it guaranteed. So, you know what? Russell Wilson should call up to Sean Watson and say, "Thank you." Now I know John Elway's not no longer running this team, 
but I have to think that the Broncos front office would like to think that this is going to be their Peyton Manning 2.0. Actually, the, the the family that's running the team now is Walmart. Yeah, the, the Walton family, believe it or not. So that- guess what? Walmart has more money that they could shit more money than we'd ever make. Does that mean we're going to get Russell Wilson in a whole bunch of Walmart ads now? Pretty much. I mean, by the way, (laughs) by the way, Russell Wilson could have held this team for ransom, considering that Deshaun Watson got two hundred and thirty million dollars guaranteed in a contract. Russell Wilson has way more value than Deshaun Watson ever had. Yeah, but you know what? He's going to try and make sure that Javante Williams and Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy all get paid. So right. that way they can actually have a championship team. Right. And like I was listening to all the reports across radio and TV. The Browns were so desperate for quarterback. He, he had already told the Browns that he, uh, uh, Deshaun said he was not coming to Cleveland. So the owner, who we all know is the most desperate owner in all of football, the Haslam family. Good old Jiminy, let your wallet be your guide. Mm-hmm. Russell Wilson gets it. He's a guy that's going to, he kind of reminds me of Brady where he's going to let the money be spread out. Take a little less. Don't get me wrong. Russell Wilson's making 49 million a year. Well, keep, well, keep this also in mind. Russell Wilson is also playing in what's probably our hardest division of all football right now <laughs> with Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs on one end, Justin Herbert and the chargers on the other, along with Keenan Allen, uh, Mike Williams and Austin Eckler. And Oh, who's this new uh, defensive person that I've charge? Oh yeah. Khalil Mack. But you know what? But you know what though? I happen to I think Denver's better than it's ever been in a couple of years. I agree. I'm just saying. Uh, and the Raiders now have Devonte a uh, weapon in Devonte Adams, Derek Carr's old college partner. So right so now I the AFC. If that, I don't know if that's al- altruism. I think that's really Russell Wilson saying, "You want me to storm the beaches of Normandy, but you want me to do it in my underwear? No, fuck that. I'm going with a tank. <laughs> I, don't take my guns away. Don't take. Don't take the guy. Don't take the guys that help to keep me upright." Please give me some weapons here. I, I, I said what it is. I said the AFC West is going to be the most competitive division in football this year, I think. But but this deal makes sense. I know it's more it does. It does money. Agree. I know it's more money technically than Deshaun Watson, but you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul here. Exactly. I agree. You're uh, robbing Peter to pay Russell. <laughs> Russell Jimmy Peter. Gar- so after all this time, Jimmy Garoppolo is staying with the 49ers. Restructured one year deal. He's basically going to be the highest paid backup. R E L A X. Which means the 49ers really, they really don't believe in Trey Lance, do they? This is a quarterback drama. Can we just turn this into 49ers of our lives? Like, just turn it into the, the, niner, ne- the Niners of our lives. Can we just turn it into the next soap opera? And you know what? Uh, Disney can make a lot of money. We just put it on ABC. Oh, actually, unfortunately, because uh, Days of Our Lives went behind the paywall uh, on uh, Peacock. On, on Peacock. Yeah. But <laughs> but I could just see it now. Niners of Our Lives, like Nick said, the newest soap opera. Garoppolo and Trey Lance are the main characters. Who's going to get killed first? No, no, no. It's going to be San Francisco 94016. <laughs> I think that's the zip code. I, I just Googled the zip code. You know what? Might as well just put them in California. 90210. <laughs> Beverly Hills 90210, Cleveland Browns 3. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, shouldn't that be Atlanta Falcons? <laughs> no, the Marcus Mariota? Line. Marcus no, Mariota, anybody? The whose line joke is Cleveland Browns 3. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Jones, by the way, is going to have a weekly spot on the ringer. <laughs> well, well I, I hate to do this with two Giants fans, but oh brother, this guy stinks! Hey, you know what? What are you? What are you upset about? I agree with you right now. I agree, and I can't wait to see what the show looks like once he gets done. <laughs> It's. I want to know how much they're paying him to do this. I mean, I don't know if he's going to get an extension, so I'm guessing the Maras worked it out where instead of an extension, we'll give you a podcast. No, he doesn't. The failure. Ooh. Sorry. No, I thought that I did that by accident. Oh, oh. but <laughs> my my point is, first of all, he doesn't have a podcast. Oh, no. Yeah, it works. But he's going on a JJ. Well, he used to be on WFAN, which, by the way. And I was telling this to the guys, obviously, myself coming from the radio space. I, I get this a lot. The WFN has the rights to the Giants broadcast. 
usually they get the quarterback for the weekly guest appearance. Why the fuck is he going on the ringer for the weekly spot? I mean, how many different variations of why did you throw seven picks in one game, Daniel? Can you come up with? <laughs> or how many times are you going to get hurt and then the team's going to fake it and say that it was just nothing? You were wide out. You were wide open, Daniel. Why did you trip over your own two feet? <laughs> hey, is that uh, maybe that's as bad as the butt fumble? I was gonna say, uh, hey, he doesn't. He doesn't have. Uh, he can't blame Evan Engram for dropping passes anymore. He's not there, so that's why I said he's. Uh, he can't blame Evan Engram for dropping <laughs> passes now. This this whole thing is stupid. I mean, this is just Bill Simmons just trying to grab athletes and put them on his network for some reason, strange reason. Bill Simmons was a has been years ago. No one cares. All right, gentlemen, it's time. It's time? It's time. <gasps> it's time. Hang on. I need to sound the alarm. <laughs> it is what? back. The rapid rundown has returned. Uh, you think we need to, you think we need a little music in the background while we make this fix? Eh, I don't know. Do we? What do you think? Okay, okay, we don't have to. It's going to be hard for me to talk over it because of the way yeah. my mic is set up, but we'll work okay. on it. We'll work on it. Okay, so we have all the games, and now since we are a Wednesday show, we can even do the Thursday games lumped well, in with everything. Before you put the games up, just so we pay it. Yes. Last year, we didn't. We were kind of all over the place with how we did the rapid rundown, what we were using. We were jumping from book to book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're now using a, a site. And you'll see this just so people know where we're getting the picks from. We're using a site called Covers.com, which is a compilation of all the books by average. So we can get the clearest cut line up to the second. Okay. It has all the books. Points Bet, DraftKings, uh, BetMGM, Caesars, Unibet, whatever you want, it's there. It basically gives you a bird's eye view of everything we're looking at. And it tells yep. you what the game opens at to where it is at the current state. Let's see, uh, Nick, if you want to pull up my uh, shared screen. All right. You see there it? we go. So this is the site. <clears throat> this is the website we're using. We're using covers.com. This has all the lines, and it's pretty good. So I'll put that back down, and uh, we'll start. And now, just so people know as well, when we did the rapid rundown last time, we were on Saturdays. Right. So we were doing the Sunday games and we could get away with the Monday the Thursday games. of the next week where we didn't have a line. Well, now we could do the Thursday games. We can do the Sunday games. All the, the way up to Monday. All the way up to Monday. All right. So, gentlemen, it all begins with the kickoff game tomorrow night. It is the Buffalo Bills visiting the defending Super Bowl champions, the LA Rams, the Rams will raise their Super Bowl banner, and then they will get to square off with some tough competition. I think the NFL has hit a bomb in a good way with an opening an open kickoff game. Wait a minute, so Roger Goodell didn't strike back this time? No, he struck, but he just struck in a completely different way. He, he struck gold rather than a vein of, of poop. Ew. All right, but by the way, this is interesting because the Bills are the road team. And they're the favorite for defending Super Bowl champion. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm I'll, I'll make the first pick because you know well, what? I'll... Let's give a little analysis just yeah. so we don't make picks right away. So what are your thoughts on the game? I, I really I guess they picked the Bills as a minus two and a half because they are one of the favorites for Super Bowl champion. But I mean the Rams are too. I mean the Rams. You know, maybe there's questions about Cam Akers with his comeback from injury. Maybe there's questions about Allen Robinson because now he's joining a team after, you know, suffering so much in Chicago and they're wondering if he can bounce back, which I think he can. Uh, and the Rams defense is still one tough defense, even though the Bills defense is just as tough. But I just think the Rams have a little more in the tank and, and they've got the home field advantage. It's a good point. What do you think, Nick? What do you think about the game? Me, I think the Bills are going to be gunning for this one, and I do think that they have improved, um, at, at, uh, uh, you know, to to a certain extent. I don't know if it's going to be that high the spread. 
I don't know if it's going to be two and a half. I would probably take like a point and a half, but I will probably say I'm going to go with the Bills. Now, just I'll, I'll throw you one more stat before you mm-hmm. decide with the line, Nick, just because make sure we say the lines as we're picking the games. But the Bills, and I couldn't believe this when I saw it, when they have to travel 2,000 miles or more, they're one eight and one against uh, against the spread. One eight and one. So if that doesn't tell you what travel does to that team, I I don't know. But to me, are you saying I should change my pick then? I, I'm just giving you a stat that I saw. So for me, and I can't believe I'm doing this right off the bat. I'm I'm taking the upset in this matchup. I'm taking the Rams. I I am as well. I am going to take the Rams. The Bills don't travel well. I just know that for a fact. So uh, that's up to you, Nick, if you want to change your pick. Nope, but I'm not changing it. I'm going with the Bills. Okay. And we will and we will keep track of all the picks this year so you can mm-hmm. see how we do each week. So uh do we haven't do we want to do any over under or should we just keep it like this? I mean, I'll give you an over under. The average over under was fifty two. Fifty two points. Hmm. I that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, these are two powerhouse defenses. That seems like a high number. Yeah. They're saying it opens at under 52. Okay, so under 52 points. Under 52. I mean, I would say we don't have to really keep track of the over unders, but we could just talk about it as a little bit of Yeah. That's a little that's a little much for me. I would say under. I think these are two powerhouse defenses to say. I think it's gonna be just under. I think 48 or 45 would have been more acceptable. Yeah. All right. right. Where are we going next? Eagles at the Lions. The Eagles are a minus four favorite. And guys, I'm going to introduce a something else new here to the rapid rundown. So each of us are going to do a bench lock. Uh, Basically our lock of the week. So gentlemen, I am going to give myself the honor and pleasure of doing our first lock here. And <laughs> I am going to lock in the Philadelphia Eagles to beat the Detroit Lions in Detroit. I just look at this Philadelphia team, and yes, all the pressure is on Jalen Hurts. But I believe in Jalen Hurts. I have believed in Jalen Hurts since he came into the NFL. And I believe now that he has a certain new weapon from Tennessee – in AJ Brown, he is going to be able to really demonstrate what he can bring to the table in terms of his throwing ability. That he's going to have some fantastic passes to AJ Brown, and don't forget he still has Devonta Smith. So I see, I see good things. The Lions, you know, they're doing okay. They're still building through. They're still, you know, like they got Aiden Hutchinson and company. They're trying to build themselves up to the draft. It's just not going to be enough against a team that I think is going to win the NFC East this year. So there's my lock. I'm locking in Eagles. Nick? I'm going to go with the Eagles. Take the money. Yeah, I'm not going to use my lock. I'm sure you know where my lock will be going sooner or later. But <laughs> um, but the I'm taking the Eagles to cover. This, this is a no doubt. The Lions are what they are. They are take, who we think they are. <laughs> take, take the money on the Eagles. The Lions are not going anywhere. I, I think that's going to be another sound effect soon, too. They are who I thought they were. Yeah, that, that'll be next. <laughs> uh, sorry. I'm trying to just put in the little things here on my, my spreadsheet. We move on now over to Chicago, where the 49ers, led by Trey Lance, will take on the Chicago. This is a no-brainer. This is really a no-brainer. Six to and be a half, a- though. Take the money. This is a no-brainer. The Bears are are in a dysfunctional hell. All right. Uh, I am going to – I'll go with the 49ers. You know what? I'm going to go with the 49ers. I'm not going to take the line, though. Really? I don't know if I want to take that line. You don't have them as a touchdown favorite against the Bears? I don't know. The Bears are – Okay, okay. I'll, I'll take the line. I'll take the line. Nick? I'm going to take the 49ers, but I'll take it by a field goal. So you're, to... you're taking them not to co- That's confusing. Okay. <laughs> the, the Bears are going to be one of the worst teams in football this year. I mean, ugh. all right. 
What's next? All right. Up next, the Pittsburgh Steel Pittsburgh Steelers will travel to Cincinnati. It's a divisional matchup, everybody, as they take on the defending AFC champion Cincinnati Bengals, who are a six and a half favorite at home. This is uh, interesting. Allow- this this is actually interesting, believe it or not. So the starter has been named within the last 24 hours or so. It is going to be Mitch Trubisky starting for Pittsburgh. Gee, shocker. Which I'm glad they said that because you know what? That just solidifies my pick of the <laughs> Bengals. I am taking the money because Mitch Trubisky is who you went with? Mitch Trubisky? I mean, don't sleep on Trubisky. Apparently, he's had a good camp with Pittsburgh. Not that I'm saying they're going to win, but apparently he's had a good camp so far. It it ain't 2018 no more, my boy. I'm not saying that he's going to be the MVP. I'm just he was supposed to be the backup. Well, that's why he was brought there. Let's let's. It's only a matter of time. It's (laughs) it's like the countdown. How long before he's benched in favor of Kenny Pickett? Well, yeah. I mean, hey, that's a Pittsburgh favorite in hometown. Um, but so, uh, but th- th- I'm gonna go with I'm gonna save you for last because I know how much you love the Bengals. Um, <laughs> this is a no-brainer for the most part. Take the money. The Bengals are gonna be spectacular this year. They're gonna pick up right where they left off. Okay, so so since you decided to kill all my high, take all my argument. I'm just gonna have my argument <laughs> be a few simple words. <clears throat> Don't disrespect the Bengals. I mean. Joe, Joe Burrow is going to be a top five quarterback this year. This is he going is. to be this is going to be a good Bengals team still. <clears throat> two, of, you have two of the best wide receivers in the game too. Speaking of divisional matchups, we've got oh. the Patriots traveling down to Miami to take on the Dolphins. Dolphins are a minus four favorite. It's Tyree Kill's first regular season game in a Dolphins uniform. It's time to start the test for Tua. I'm I'm a little concerned, actually, to be honest. So I'm going to disagree, and I'm actually going to take Miami, and I will take that line. I still have not forgiven you guys for convincing me out of that game where Miami basically, uh, in 2018, pulled off the unbelievable upset, the miracle down there in Miami, where Gronk failed that tackle miserably. I had I was going to pick them, and then I went with New England. My, New England struggles down in Miami. And as much as I don't think, you know, like Johnny, where he thinks that the Patriots are about to go down into the toilet, I think the Patriots are still wild card contendable. I don't think they win down in sunny Miami, especially not with uh, that two a Tyree combination, which I think will be hot to start. But the rest of the season, we'll see. By the way, I think uh, Tyreek opened his mouth just a tad too much in training camp. Would you agree with me on that point? Well, I mean, it, it it doesn't help Tua. That's what I mean. It, it doesn't help Tua any favors. I mean, this game is weird. I mean, all these years, New England beat the crap out of Miami for years. I look at the line. It's under 44 total, which is not as big as I thought. Um, New England's going to struggle. This is like going to be the first time in years that they're not like on top of the world and they have. They don't have Tom Brady anymore, obviously. So they're not going to get all the flags and all that you stuff. You have Mac Jones. Who cares? Mac Jones is not Tom Brady. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm. You know, I'm I, go ahead. I'm with you, Tom. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take the Dolphins. Take the money. We gotta. We gotta have some good start to this to, to a Tyree combination. I, I'm hoping, and that's why when I look at the Patriots and I look at Mac Jones, and I'm like. Hopefully, he can have a better year, and maybe they can improve. But they don't have; a, they don't really have any offense. They really don't. That's what scares me, to be honest. I think it's going to be a light cover, but this is going to be a game that's like going to go back and forth until the end. And you don't say that about the Patriots very often. So I don't, not quite sure if I get this. The Browns at the Panthers, and the Panthers are only a one and a half. It's a pick'em game, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I'm conf- so I'm I'm confused. I'd basically be an idiot to use my bench lock on this, so I'm not. So here's the thing. Um, yeah, it's basically a pick'em game. So you know what? I'm I'm gonna go with the home field advantage and take the Panthers. So- uh this is a no-brainer. 
They don't have Deshaun. Their team is in shambles. There's no chemistry. This is an obvious take the money. I think what's going on here is maybe the expectation that after those comments from, from Baker that he has suddenly walked back, the Browns defense might be having a you know a fire lit under them. And to be fair, the Browns defense is still hella competitive. It's just that offense that I think is going to be bottom 12 this year because Deshaun's suspended for 11 games. So Jacoby that, Versett. That's hey, all I, I have hey, to I, say. You can't win a game without scoring some points at least. Right. So in that case... I am going to go with the Panthers, and I think it's going to mirror what happened with Sam Darnold last year, where the Panthers will look good for a couple of games and then just... You know what the scary part is? They have the com combined over 41 and a half in this game. Combined over 41 and a half. Is that ridiculous? 41 and a half? I'd take the under on that one, to be honest with you. There's no way there's 42 points being scored in this game. No way. But yeah, I would. This is a this is the most obvious cover, and I wouldn't even use a bench lock on it. All right, Colts at the Texans. The Colts are a minus seven favorite. All right, this this one is one of the most obvious. I don't think we even need to have a discussion about this. The Texans are going to be fighting for the number one overall pick coming this season. And uh, the Colts may have uh, Matt Ryan making his Colts debut. Cover. Yeah, I'm taking the money too. Yeah, I'm going to cover this one. Colts uh, got more divisional matchups. Saints and the Falcons. Speaking of teams competing for the number one overall pick, cover, cover, cover. Okay, okay. Let's get even more ridiculous. Ravens at the Jets. <laughs> I think I know where the bench lock's coming in. I am going to use the bench lock. Boom. I mean, French lock. I am taking the Ravens by seven. This is the, this was my bench lock. Thanks for stealing my thunder, by the way. But yes, bench lock. This is going to be fourteen to fifteen points at least. Oh, double bench lock. Okay, double bench lock. This is going to be this is going to be an embarrassment in week one. I'm calling it now. You need to get All the right. sound effect of a lock of a lock clanking shut. I know. Door. I'll get it. We'll have it for next week. Well, well let's say, well, I, I should stop doing this because that's NFL game day's thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but this, is, this is obvious. Bench lock times two here. Yeah, Ravens. I'm just going to go a little riskier with the Eagles lines, if, if you want to call that riskier. <laughs> I guess. Uh, Jaguars at Commanders to wrap up the one o'clock matchups on Sunday. The Commanders are two and a half point favorites. I mean, at least they got the line right. Yeah, uh, and honestly, I'll just go with the home home field advantage. Yeah. I'll go Commanders. I, I am too, because there's really nothing. Unless you live in Jacksonville or, or, or Northern Virginia, there's really nothing there for you. So really, two and a half. Two and a this, half. this is scary. The under 43 and a half combined for this game. 40, I would take that under. <laughs> yeah, I would take that under. And yeah, I would... I wouldn't watch this game if you paid me to watch it. That's how bad this matchup is. Uh, and Carson Wentz can go take a hike also. Because how many times has he been traded now? Two or three times? I mean... Well, he was only traded after they blew it last season. Oh, that's what the Colts get. Uh, but take the money. All right. Four o'clock matchups. We got four of them on Sunday. And it begins with the game of the, one of the national games of the week. It's the Packers traveling over to Minnesota. To take on those Vikings, the Packers. -E -L -A -X. The Packers are only a one and a half point favorite, which seems like it should be bigger because they've still the Vikings are still running Kirk Cousins out under center. I but you know what, the Vikings have Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, and KJ Osborne. Who does it, who did the Green Bay have? Alan Lazard. They have nobody. No weapons. Romeo Dubes. Yeah, you got a couple cruise missiles, but you know what? You can't you can't fire the damn thing by just having a dozen people pick it up and throw it. The only weapon he has is Pat McAfee on his weekly uh, radio hit. So I mean, they they got to split the Packers and Vikings with how they are right now. This year, they they got to split. It's just a matter of what game is this going to be. I'm going to take the Packers, but I think it's going to definitely be by a touchdown or more. Yeah, I mean. This is tough because the Vikings have 
the best young wide receiver in all of football. They have they have the potential to be a wild card team this season, and they have the home field advantage. And should Aaron Rodgers suddenly go down, that would open up the opportunity for the Vikings to take the North. I but mean, I, I just I just don't know if the Packers are that team to get off to a wrong start to the season by losing a game to the Vikings in week one. I don't know if they're that kind of team. I mean, the Vikings are one of the better home teams in all of the NFL. Their fans are the best, in my opinion, the way they dress up, the way they do everything. I'm not a big believer of Aaron Rodgers. I mean, I know he's won back to back MVPs. I don't see him winning a third MVP that that would be unprecedented. Again, Again, I'm just concerned about his wide receiver core and they, if they still need time together. You know what, guys? I'm going to go with the upset. I'm going to go with the hometown home field advantage. I'm going to go with the Vikings. Yeah, I mean, Aaron Rodgers has no weapons. This is going to be interesting to see. I, I'm taking the Vikings on the upset. Oh, you're going to go Vikings? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we go to the Vikings. And now from one of my Nick. Uh, Nick, did you give our- your line on this game or no? He went Packers. He said oh, okay. it'll, be, it'll be by a touchdown. Oh, okay. Got okay, it. so we go now from Nick Federer and I's likable Vikings to our lovable but miserable New York Giants, a five-and-a-half-point underdog to the Tennessee Titans. Wow. And the Titans are the home team, so uh, Titans. <laughs> Derek Henry, how many rods is he going to run for? You know what the funny part about this? The line originally opened up at six and a half and went down to five and a half. So I don't know what gave the Giants that extra point. It's but... only the, it's only the fact that 50 bajillion is not actually a number. That's the only thing that's stopping him from actually running for 50 bajillion yards. Can, can I say one thing that's in your favor? Ryan Tannehill is actually in your favor. Yeah, but they still have Derrick Henry. It's oh. still they, you still got Derrick Henry, and he's still going to be running all over Daniel Jones's face with his diamond studded cleats. Okay, I get well. Okay, but my point is, if Ryan Tannehill can't get rid of the football and he's going to get sacked fifteen times, you can only run the football so much. You, you, you know what? I I you know what? I could see it. I could see a universe. Where the Giants could win this game, but it's not this one. So I'm taking the money. I'm just I'm just trying to throw yeah, I don't live in that universe where I get to have that. I'm just yeah. trying to throw it. I'm just trying to throw a scenario I, I, at I, you. I get yeah. what you're doing, Nick Morgison, but we can't have nice things. I'm not exactly I'm not exactly an an expert in quantum physics and alternate dimensions. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm I'm gonna take the cover, but I'm just trying to make the analysis to you that if Ryan Tannehill gets sacked a bunch of times and can't get rid of the football, it could be closer than you think. I understand that, but I don't live in a yeah, I don't live All in right. a universe of sunshine move, and parks. Move. We got better games to talk about. Divisional battle, Raiders now with Devontae <laughs> Adams at wide receiver against the Chargers. This is a good one. Don't count the Raiders out, but you know what? Justin Herbert is still the guy. So he's another gonna, one of my top five quarterbacks. I agree. I'm gonna take Chargers. the Chargers by that line. I'm gonna take the money. I mean Everyone's going to look at the Raiders as like the dark horse pick in a lot of games this year. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say, all right, which games can they upset certain teams? And I mean, this is one of them, but I just think, I just think there's something special about the Chargers this year that they, they, they can't go another year missing the playoffs with Herbert at the helm. It can't happen. I mean, I think I was, my crystal ball was right last season where I basically said every week, Justin Herbert was the top five quarterback. Right. Or even a they still. Yeah. Well, did they make? I think they made the playoffs. They made the playoffs the and got eliminated, but in the wild card. They they, <laughs> they, they got to make it back. They got to make it back and win the game. That was one of my bold predictions for the season. They got to win a playoff game. Yeah, I mean the Raiders are not there yet, but I think the Raiders are going to be a good team and they're going to compete. Pieces are there. The but, pieces are there. You know, Mahomes may not be at the top of the AFC for much longer. Right. I, I would take the money just because Herbert's one of my favorite quarterbacks so far in the league. I wish we could have had Herbert when he was up in the draft. But that's neither here nor there. All right. So that brings us, speaking of Mahomes, to Chiefs at Cardinals. Chiefs a minus six favorite. So it's Chiefs' first game without Tyree Kill. I mean, they still, he still has traffic, Kelsey. Of course, uh, DeAndre Hopkins serving the first game of his six-game suspension. That's going to hurt them big time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the Chiefs just because I, I trust Mahomes and uh, Mahomes and Kelsey. If Hopkins was here and he was playing, this would be a whole different game. 
it would be a whole different game where I, I I would almost consider a cut like a going against this line. But with Hawkins being out, that's a main weapon for Kyler in a lot of ways. That was his weapon. So yeah, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the uh, I'm gonna take. The line. Yeah, this this is money cover all the way without Hopkins. All right, Sunday night game of the week. It's the Buccaneers and those <laughs> Dallas Cowboys. How about them Cowboys? How about them Cowboys? How about them Cowboys? <laughs> Minus two and a half. The Buccaneers are the favorite on the road. And them Cowboys, I hate him so much. <laughs> so. Uh, I, again, I expressed this when I was talking about how I would pick the Eagles over the Cowboys for the division set. The Cowboys just lost too many pieces in the offseason. I have questions about them. You know, Injuries have, also. Injuries. I know I have questions about Brady and company because I know Godwin's a little shaky. Brady <laughs> having the 40-day retirements. But you know what? It's still the Buccaneers. It's still an NFC favorite. I can't go against them. I'm going to take the line even on the road. The one thing I would say, though, is that the Bucks' front line protecting Brady is going to be a mess. And Tom Brady is going to get sacked way more than he has in years past. I, I don't know how many times, <coughs> excuse me, but I think that he's going to get sacked a lot more. He's going to have to run for his life a little bit more. But I'm a Dak hater. I do not like Dak. And now I know that I'm talking to two biased Giant fans over here. They're going to well, hate I Dak mean, to I begin think, with. I think the Cowboys do have a chance because they still have a pretty decent defense. It's just a matter, but you know, it's still Tom Brady. It, it's still Brady. No, but I think Dak is the most overrated quarterback in the NFL. I see. I don't. Th I <clears throat> I think it's exactly. I think he, it's exactly the opposite. He's what? one of the most underrated quarterbacks. Why? Know, but it's just it's just the fact that he's playing. On a Cowboys team that's not that good. Nick, he can't win. I think one I person think, does not a team make. I was gonna say I think I think it's more in the middle. I think Dak is right where he is graded to be, and I think you know he has shown flashes. And, and Nick, you're Morgan, you're right. He has shown some mistakes at times, but who's around him? You know, I mean, there's still C.D. Lamb. There's still Michael Gallup. Jalen Tolbert's a rookie. We still got to see what the hell he's got. But again, it goes to my point. I think the Cowboys just have lost too many pieces. This is still a team that's developing. You know, the Buccaneers, you know, maybe it's still a little bit older players. But, you know, I think the Buccaneers' chemistry is still there. Yes, maybe the line is weaker. But I think the chemistry is still there. That leads me to go Buccaneers. Plus, it's great. I mean – it's tough going in on the road on week one. I'll say that too, but you're right. It's Tom Brady. They still have some weapons. The Cowboys, I don't trust. Everyone's saying, and I think I said it on our preview show, Dak has to be the MVP if they're going to make a run. He has to play like one at least. He's got to, well, no, I'm saying he needs to be the MVP if they want to make a long run. It's not going to happen. I know. But, I was going to say, but you're saying he could, because he could be, the, he could, you know, make a good argument for himself, but they'll still give it to Brady or Rodgers because it's Brady and Rodgers. Take the money. All right. Monday night game to close things out on the rapid rundown for week one. The Seahawks at the Broncos. So Russell Wilson makes a debut against his former team, but it's not in his former city. It's in his new city. Okay, Roger Goodell strikes back. He messed this one up. <laughs> no, I'm it? serious. I, I'm really serious. That should have been in Seattle. You would have had a ratings bonanza if this was in Seattle. I, I you would have, yeah, you would have had a ratings bonanza. But you know what? I, I, I'm still gonna take. I'm still gonna take the Broncos. <laughs> yeah, I mean, looking at this line, six and a half. It's not enough, actually. I think it should be more. I think it should be a double-digit line. The Seahawks are going to be one of the worst teams of football up there with the Falcons and the Texans. Do you trust Geno Smith to be to really cover a line? No. no. I, I I still have PTSD from being the Jets quarterback. I still have PTSD from being the Giants quarterback. To, to, uh, uh, to make a reference to what one man once said about Mark Sanchez, I don't trust Geno Smith to throw me a paper bag sandwich. <laughs> I, I'm with you. I'm, I agree with you. So, yeah, this one is really easy. It, covering plus uh, at least three and a half to a double-digit lead. So take them up. Hashtag Broncos country. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. All right. That is the end of the rapid rundown, but we're not done quite fully, guys, because there is one more story that we have to talk about. Yes! 
Yes! <laughs> so, have you ever seen a celebration where somebody wins a fight and they take off their shirt? Well, you, let's well, clarify, they play, though. They flash the crowd. They flash no, 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 but you have to clarify that even more, though, because guys do weird things all the time. Women, on the other hand, that's not 100% appropriate. Well, Nick, welcome to the world of combat sports. Welcome to the world of, of fighting. I, was, I, I can't even say MMA because it's bare-knuckle boxing. Like, this is... They're verified. They're verified on social media. They must I be know. something. It, Nick, Nick, it's the new. I told you earlier. It's the new outlaw promotion. That it's boxing, but they don't wear the big gloves. They just tape up their fists. It's old fashioned. Yeah, it's a tribute to the old fashioned underground. Style. It's Vince McMahon style. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in some ways, was. I was gonna, yeah, I was going to be careful with that statement now. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, my point is. <clears throat> when I saw this clip and I was like, hmm, views, social media, this is dangerous. So and <laughs> how do I explain this? You don't. You don't <laughs> explain I it. Don't want you to. Look, somebody has to. Context is necessary. So we always we context is always necessary. So somebody has to explain it. So who's going to draw the short straw out of the three of us? I'll do it. <clears throat> so this uh was she a boxer you said tom bare knuckle fighter ty Bear, emery ty Wins emery wins her fight. fight jumps up on the rope and decides to lift her top and to the crowd to to pull to pull the full strip tease and well well you can't see all the way to florida but uh <laughs> well, I, you know, the, the commentator is saying like that's one of the most interesting celebrations i've ever seen well, Which is putting it mildly to say the least. But I, I, I see this and I'm like, wait, what just happened? What? There, is, there is no way that we as 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 <laughs> as, as, as sexual guys can, can can talk about this without sounding like creepy creepazoids. So no no, but but the reason I brought it up is I was like, oh god, that sounded inappropriate. Anyway, <laughs> um <laughs> no, no, but I have to why? Why is it two weeks in a row? Last week, it's Conor McGregor seemingly getting uh, some a specific sexual act, and now it's this. Well, this isn't Why? a sexual act. This isn't a sexual act, though. It's like, I said Conor McGregor got one, not. But I, you know what? It's funny though. I mean, to prove that it actually does numbers, it, I just checked it again. It's at seventy-one and a half thousand Twitter impressions. Our tweet about this. So Our tweet, yes. If you, if you know what sells, nudity sells. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, it's an old chestnut, but sex sells. No, I was gonna say yes. I was gonna go that step further, but yeah, I I I mean, we don't need to act all puritan or or go in the other direction and be creepy, you know, creepy perverts about this stuff. No, but, we're well, not. But I just I find it interesting that those two tweets we put out. <laughs> Why is it that that stuff is what we're known for? Well, it's not that we're known for it. It's what's Why trending. Is it that gets the most traction. Hey, that's the way to build the following. You put certain videos out like that, and then you build content off that stuff. Oh, God, ladies and gentlemen. It's just this is combat sports. And I don't know if the lunatics are running the asylum, but they, they are. Have, they have a say. They are. Oh, man. Uh, the first week of football, the first week of rapid rundown, and then this weird story. Okay, once again, make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so that way you get notified of everything from Empty the Bench to Beyond the Bench, Game On, MMA Outsiders, Broody Serial, Living Life, and so much more. Make sure to follow us across social media at ETV Sports and at ETV Network. You'll see our social media scrolling across the bottom. And yeah, football is back. Hallelujah. It's about damn time. I was getting tired of all the NBA BS in the offseason. Wait a minute. That's going to be back in a month, too. Oh, God. <laughs> so, for Nick Morgison and Nick Federa, I'm Tal Albano. We will see you next time here on Empty the Bench. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week.